on behalf of festival co-director Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, welcome back to JLF's Brave New World. JLF's Brave New World, featuring Nobel laureates, Booker, Pulitzer, Commonwealth, Sahitya Academy award-winning writers, has completed over a hundred episodes with over three million views in these past uh, four months. All our sessions, in case you want to view them, are available to view on our Facebook page, JLF LitFest, and on our YouTube channel, Jaipur LitFest JLF. Our official radio partner is Red FM, Bajate Raho. Our session today is the new great game, Bruno Macias and Shiv Shankar Menon in conversation. A session that discusses how Asia can search for a constructive new equilibrium in the face of the growing tensions between China and its neighbors. Author, political scientist, and politician, Bruno Macias and diplomat, writer, and former national security advisor, Shiv Shankar Menon, speak of the deeper implication of China's imperial overstretch and the geopolitics and global influences of the new great game. Bruno Macias was the Minister of European Affairs in Portugal from 2013 to 2015. He is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute in Washington and the Renmin University in Beijing, and the author of two recent books, The Dawn of Eurasia and Belt and Road. His upcoming book is titled, History Has Begun, The Birth of a New America. Shiv Shankar Menon is currently a visiting professor at Ashoka University. He is the chairman of the advisory board at the Institute of Chinese Studies a distinguished visiting research fellow at the National University of Singapore, NUS. And he's also served as national security advisor to the Prime Minister of India from January 2010 to May 2014. And previously as Foreign Secretary of India from October 2006 to August 2009. A career diplomat, he has served as ambassador or high commissioner of India to Israel, Sri Lanka, China, and Pakistan. His book, Choices Inside the Making of an Indian Foreign Policy, was published in 2016. Please do remember to comment and ask questions by typing it into the comment section below. And do follow our handle, J JLF LitFest, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get notified on the upcoming sessions. And in case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues, you can find us on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Litfest JLF. And of course, if we drop off, hang in there, we'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, Bruno Macias and Shiv Shankar Menon in conversation. Over to you both. Evening, Bruno. Hi, good evening, Shiv Shankar. Uh, great pleasure to be with you again. Well, Hope all is well. We, uh, we actually uh, met for the first time in Jaipur back in January. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, if it wasn't the exact day of the Wuhan lockdown, it must be have been around it because I know yes. I was in Jaipur when they announced uh, the news. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, although there was a turning point, we all suddenly realized how serious it was. Uh, it has become even more serious since then uh, with huge implications for world politics, uh, the current pandemic. But that hasn't been the only development in the past six months, very eventful six months. And we had, uh, of course, the goal on... Uh, clash uh, between Chinese and, uh, and Indian forces. And we had as well the ongoing movement towards a more confrontational relationship between the United States and, uh, and China. Uh, I think these three topics offer a good beginning to our conversation. Uh, let me pick one. They, they, the three of them are very important, but let me pick one, perhaps uh, one that I've been thinking about more, more, more than um, than, than any other. Uh, this idea of a new Cold War, what do you think about this? Um, are you among those who, who think this really is a new Cold War, similar to the, uh, the Cold War between uh, the West and uh, the Soviet Union? And a second part to that question, do you think this new Cold War will also be a Cold War between blocs, or do you regard it as essentially an affair between the United States and China? And do you think it will be possible this time around for other countries, and India is particularly on my mind, to, um, 
to remain non-aligned, but perhaps in in a, in a more substantive way than than during the original Cold War, um, non-aligned but fully sovereign uh, and having influence and power in world politics. Uh, how do you think about about this? Well, my own sense, Bruno, and it's great to see you again, even though only virtually. Uh, I wish we could do this in person. Uh, my own sense is that we're not really in a new Cold War at all. I think the Cold War is a wrong analogy for what we face because the U.S. and China, and the assumption is it's binary between China and the U.S., I presume, you know, they're still intertwined economically. I mean, they do more trade with each other than any other two powers on earth, if you look at it today. These are the two largest economies. And secondly, we are today in a globalized world economy, whether we like it or not. We might be trying to roll it back. We might be trying to decouple. There might be strong elements who feel offended by this, who feel their identity is threatened by the globalized world. But even so, it is still an interdependent world. My fear is that we're not going into a Cold War, which was a structure and quite organized in many ways. It actually gave predictability to the international system. Uh, but we are actually fragmenting. Politically, economically, the world economy is breaking down into regional sort of large economic groupings, whether it's NAFTA or its modern equivalent in North America, RCP in, centered on China and Asia, and the EU, and then truly non-aligned states like India then are outside this global framework. Now, India did very well out of the globalized world economy. China was the greatest beneficiary, but India was probably the second greatest. So when you said, how would you feel about it? But I do think you're right. We are in for much more contentious uh, China-US relations in the years to come. And that's going to make everyone's life more difficult, everyone else's life much more difficult. But I don't think that they can still quite decouple or be completely separate, living in two separate worlds, the way the Soviet Union and the US were during the Cold War. I don't think that's where we're heading. I think technology also contributes to that. And that's the other big driver of change, I think, in our world today. Yes, you might have two separate internets, but that doesn't mean that the Chinese don't come onto Twitter, which they don't permit in their own country, or that the Americans don't try and use cyberspace to get into what happens in the Chinese cyberspace. And so for me, actually, it's a much more complicated situation. I think for me also, the biggest complicating factor is that all our country's domestic politics has seen the rise of new authoritarians. And this makes negotiation, give and take, bargaining, diplomacy much harder because they depend on ultranationalism. So yes, we're in for a harder time for much, if you look at all the issues that you mentioned, you know, whether it's Galwan, whether it's, it's Hong Kong, whether it's South China Sea, all these are now much hotter than they were before. Uh, but they're not dealt with in a Cold War framework. Now, I'd like to ask you, actually, where do you think Europe fits into this kind of fragmented, complicated world? I wouldn't call it a multipolar world yet, because the world is multipolar economically, but not politically or militarily yet. Uh, but where, how does this work for Europe? I think it's still an open question. Um, clearly Europe, but that was already true of, uh, of the original Cold War. Um, I think the inclination in Europe was always to try to find a sovereign voice, particularly after the creation of the single market, uh, where Europe felt confidence it could start to do that. Uh, and by the end of the Cold War, you had in fact Europe taking decisions uh, that were very badly received in Washington, particularly on trade with the Soviet Union. Uh, and both French and German decision makers uh, were trying to find an independent position. I think that it's even more true now, as Europe is more self-confident economically, it has become a, a powerhouse. So I see uh, the attempt difficult to try to find a middle path. Um, certainly, we want to, as a German minister said just a week ago, to lock horns with China when necessary, but not 
to follow the United States in some of the decisions that have been made. Uh, particularly what I see in Europe is a certain um, uh, displeasure, uh, discontent with the American view that China has to be isolated, uh, contained and even I think excluded from the global community and the global economy. Sometimes, particularly Pompeo seems to suggest this, and this is a view that is not going to find uh, a receptive audience in, in Europe uh, because of our interdependence with China, but also because ideologically Europeans are still very committed to the ideals of globalization, as you were talking about. And so we want to have a more competitive relationship with China, but we want China to be integrated into what we call the global community. And we think it would be very dangerous to uh, to, to try to exclude it um, uh, and impossible uh, given the size and the dynamism of, of the Chinese economy. I'm trying to summarize what I think is the mainstream opinion in Europe, but of course uh, there are China hawks uh, and they, they're stronger now than six months ago. Uh, and there are China doves uh, who in fact uh, probably would, would find my description even, even too hawkish. Um, Sounds like uh, how India. How do you interpret, uh, I've been puzzled by this, and I'm sure you have as well, because you're so such a keen observer of Chinese politics, and this has been very relevant in Europe over the past six months, uh, to the extent that China is in a weaker position in Europe now, and I think it is, it's of China's own making, because its diplomacy has been extraordinarily aggressive over the past few months. Uh, uh, in some cases, you had official accounts of Chinese embassies in Europe blaming the local authorities for their inability to address the COVID crisis, which is extraordinary. How do you interpret this, uh, at first glance, rather puzzling approach that China has taken instead of trying to take advantage of the void left by the United States over the past few months in terms of global leadership? They have adopted what has become known as the wolf warrior diplomacy, and they've seemed to be creating trouble in so many uh, spots at the same time. What are they doing? Is this deliberate? What is the purpose? Um, is it... Um, do you think uh, it was not planned? Uh, uh, how do you interpret these developments? If you agree with me that it has... Um, China had become more aggressive over the years, we know that, but over the past few months, it has been placed in overdrive. Mm. In my own sense, and I mean, correct me, because you know this, you watch this very closely. My own sense is that COVID and the economic crash that came with COVID actually was such a shock for all the powers, not just for China. China may have recovered out of it relatively quickly or had managed to control it, but it was such a shock that there was a moment, there was a period of tremendous domestic stress. And if you look at the pattern of Chinese diplomacy, wolf warrior diplomacy, or this sort of assertive aggressive diplomacy, has really been seen whenever there's huge domestic stress, where it's important for Chinese diplomats or journalists or whoever is outside to be seen at home as being patriotic and not letting down the side. So he's playing to a domestic audience because he's not sure what's going to happen at home. And he doesn't want to be outflanked or accused of being soft or having gone, been anti-national. And... I think in the last week or so, we've seen some attempts to roll this back. We've seen Wang Yi speaking much more positively about the relationship with the U.S. Uh, I, the problem, I think, we've also seen that even the official spokesman, the ambassador to the U.S. and so on, have tried, I think, to lower the temperature a bit. The problem here is that I think both China and the U.S. are today under considerable domestic stress. Uh, the U.S. has a presidential election, and clearly, I mean, the administration doesn't want COVID or the economy to be the issue, and China, for them, is a good issue to wrap themselves in the flag, and therefore the four horsemen making their grand speeches, threatening regime change, and actually going much further than I think mainstream American opinion actually would go if it weren't for the election. 
And you can already hear differences between what the Trump people and what the Biden people are saying on China. Neither wants to be outflanked, but as, as long as the election is coming. But there are differences, I think. Uh, in China itself, you now have a rectification movement in the party, which is not something that it happens in normal times. Uh, and rectification has a whole, I mean, the idea of a purge, it's, you know, it's, it's quite a serious matter, I think. And when we look at, at the way internal developments are going in China, I would say domestic, that it is actually domestic politics in both countries which is driving this. And that's also the source, primary source of this wolf warrior diplomacy. I think the result is unfortunate because I can, I actually told a friend the other day, I cannot think of a time when China was more isolated since then, since the Cultural Revolution, the end of the Cultural Revolution, uh, where she has managed to alienate. I mean, strange. I mean, you, you saw the way the African countries voted in, in the WHO on the question of an investigation into how COVID came about. I mean, I, I, frankly, that should have been a bit of a, a shock. I, I think, I assume it was, because we have seen some signs of correction. The problem here is, as I said, from authoritarian politics, once you wrap yourself in the flag, you claim nationalism as your legitimacy, it's much harder to do the give and take of diplomacy, to make compromises, to actually accept other people's points of view and to, to therefore to live in a larger community. So I, I think we're in for at least a few years of, of relatively difficult politics. But you know, China-US is not the only game in town. And ultimately, it's, I think all these leaders will have to decide, do they want to get their economies back up and running again or not? And that for them, is the best way to shore up popular support for themselves, no matter how well or badly they performed on COVID and various other things. Uh, uh, if they can get their economies going, I think they would feel a lot easier than, and maybe we'll see less of this kind of wolf warrior diplomacy, not just by China, but actually seeing it by, by other leaders as well. And maybe- Let's, we'll, let, let's talk a, a little bit about India. Um, but, but let me ask you a, a quick question before we turn to India. Um, if I understand correctly what you're saying, you think China is in a weaker position today than it was six months ago when, when we met in Jaipur before? The I COVID think China has pandemic. less friends abroad today than she did six months ago. And I think the kind of pushback that China has faced in various spheres I think, I hope, has led to some re-examination of wolf warrior diplomacy. Now, India, I, I have an, a number of topics and questions that I take every opportunity where I meet a, <laughs> an Indian friend to, to talk a little bit about. And um, perhaps our audience, particularly our, our audience in India, has, has listened to many discussions about this, but we have many people also from outside India. One thing I'm interested in is going back to the origins of the current clash and Galwan clash uh, and how you interpret that. Um, but I would also like to talk a little bit about um, India's position in the new geopolitics. Uh, I'm one of those who observing from the outside uh, remain very skeptical of the idea that India will um, align with the United States uh, completely on, on a China policy. Um, I think that it, I, I, I regard that as, a, as, as an impossible. Uh, and finally, the economic side of this, which I regard as very important. Um, I, I wrote a piece for the Times of India arguing that the real game was, was not in the Himalaya, but it was in, uh, in, in, in the app development and 5G and technology. Um, and this is where India, in fact, uh, could uh, become a serious obstacle to Chinese power. Uh, and then of course the government decided to ban a number of apps. Uh, and again, just as with the Belt and Road where the Indian government seemed to be ahead of the United States uh, in uh, declaring an open opposition to the Belt and Road in 2017, uh, 
uh, with this question of uh, banning TikTok and WeChat, again, the Indian government seemed to be a few months ahead of the US. Uh, so always uh, leading the most current developments. But uh, okay, so I threw I threw three topics on the table. Please uh, please pick what 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 are you interested in. But um, for me and for the audience, particularly those that are not in India, uh, how do you help us understand what is happening uh, in India today and uh, in Indian geopolitics? Well, on all three, on the clash, for instance, I think that's a good example of what you were saying earlier of wolf warrior diplomacy of actions abroad, because I think if you Look at the latest polls. I think today less than 23% of Indians look at China favorably. And that's a huge drop from almost a little below 40%. And today, almost every Indian I talk to when he's asked about relations with China says there's no question. We have to reset them. We can't go on the way we were before. And most people have a very negative view of China. And there can will I, can be... I just... Can I just stop you there and, and ask, why is that? Is it um, the question it's, of ideology, democracy, values? It's partly is because it history? Of this, is it geography? I think it's the sense that, look, we respected the agreements we had signed to maintain the status quo. China chose to change them unilaterally, militarily, to try and occupy places which had been under our control for, for many years, to stop us from patrolling where we've been patrolling before. And despite all that we've done, this is no way to pay back good behavior. And so there is a sense of betrayal because of what the PLA has done in Ladakh since April onwards. Uh, but as for India's position, will it drive India much closer to the US? India's relationship with the US has been transformed steadily for the last 25 years. It's not purely China driven. It's driven by the need to transform India and the US's role in the Asia Pacific, in the Indo Pacific. Uh, now, for us, the US is a very useful partner in whether it's technology, whether it's economically, but whether it's maritime security, whether it's cyber security, and a whole range of counterterrorism, for instance. So we, we do work together. And since the maritime spaces from the Indo-Pacific all the way from Africa to the west coast of the US are today contested between China, the US, and various other powers. I mean, there are local powers, Japan, India, Indonesia, you know, many of us, there, Vietnam has claimed South China Sea, everyone knows how contested that is. Since that maritime space is contested, we have found increasing congruence with the US. But we are also a continental power. And there is almost no US presence on the continent. Once she pulls out of Afghanistan, Eurasia actually is not going to see very much either commercial or military or even political presence of the US on the Eurasian continent, on the landmark. And that's where the clashes happen. That's where we have a border dispute with China, the biggest in the world. So. To the extent that, yes, we have increasing congruence with the U.S., particularly in the maritime domain, but also on other questions of global order, et cetera, where we do have some agreements or maybe and could have more in the future, we will work with the U.S. But as our foreign minister made it quite clear the other day, he said, we're unlikely to get into any alliance, but we will work with our partners. My personal sort of mantra that I use is issue-based coalitions of the willing. We work with whoever is willing to be our partner who shares our interests. And this will vary depending on the issue. If it's counterterrorism, it's going to be a certain group of countries who have capacity and willingness. Uh, if it's maritime security, it's another group of countries who will have. And this could include China, not include China. It depends on what we're doing. Uh, how, how do you see um, the, the Indian and the Biden presidency? Because... It's, it's possible to imagine that... Um, so you've decided he's winning? Kind of, uh, oh, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I am assuming he's winning. Yeah. I, feel, okay. I feel confident he's winning, but, mm -hmm. but, but, it, but we have to discuss it anyway. It's yeah. possible, more likely than, than a Trump win. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one could see a certain return to this evangelical liberalism, even of the Obama years, 
and relations between India and, and the United States could become uh, more difficult because one, one could see the question, old question of Indutva appearing more and more. Um, certainly the, the US media uh, feels very strongly about this and uh, obviously a Biden administration is gonna be much more receptive to that uh, intellectual and, and political environment. Um, so this is still a very unpredictable relationship, uh, don't you think? Well, I'm not sure whether, you know, to what extent the Biden administration can actually go back to earlier U.S. practices. I think they still have a primary job of fixing polarized U.S. politics and will have to spend a lot of effort on rebuilding partnerships and alliances. Uh, and so... Yes, I'm sure there'll be a very strong verbal commitment to human rights, to various other, to democracy abroad, etc. And yet I think America has always shown an ability to be practical enough to work with whoever, as long as interests coincide. And that basic realist foundation of American policy, I think, will remain. In fact, part of the problem is that... Uh, this administration's policies are unpredictable because they're not based on a coherent set of principles or even, it's not even like the neocons have come to power. It's, it's, it's very different. We're here dealing with tweets, with, with whims, with ideas, some of which the president's ideas, for instance, on Russia have not been implemented. Uh, so it's very hard to, to say how we'll move from this uncertainty to a different kind of uncertainty where, frankly, my own sense is that India and the U.S. have enough in common and so many common interests that we will continue to keep building the relationship. It, there might be new patchy bits which might be more difficult. I mean, the U.S. reaction to say some of the things that uh, are being done in India to try and build a Hindu Russia, for instance. I mean, those, you know, there could be U.S. reactions to that. But overall, I think the relationship will, will manage that. But I do expect the, a Biden administration, if it comes, to be different in the way it deals with partners and allies. I think that's one of the first things they'll do because they will have so many domestic preoccupations to worry about. I think their need for and reliance on allies will be more than before. And that's something that I, I would expect. Uh, and that, I think, is good for Europe, good for India as well, in our relationships with the U.S. But, uh, you know, my own, I'm not sure, though, where the economy is going to drive all this. Because today, what COVID has done is actually to help the fragmentation, right? It looks as though you're now creating an East Asian bubble of countries who have managed to maybe control or suppress COVID, and they can then travel and trade with each other, whether it's Japan, Korea, China, you know, a few, uh, whether Europe does that to itself, uh, whether North America, well, who knows what will happen. Uh, now, that actually only exaggerates the fra fragmentation that I was talking about. So where do you think the world economy is going? And how do you well, think it's going to come out of this? And what, what does it do to our politics? Right, for me, the, the importance of, of the pandemic is um, in the way countries will recover at different paces and, uh, and, and perhaps that will create geopolitical opportunities. Uh, uh, I think China will have an opportunity, for example, to acquire assets, to continue its campaign of acquiring assets abroad and in this case, perhaps at depressed prices, um, even in parts of Europe, that will certainly be possible. We're just at the beginning. Uh, we just found out that Spain contracted 18% of GDP in, in, in the second quarter and France 14%. Uh, so we shouldn't think that the recovery will be easy. And certainly those that recover more quickly, and China does seem to be recovering more quickly, will have opportunities. And then I wouldn't even exclude uh, dramatic scenarios where some countries uh, don't recover at all and, and go through an economic or political collapse. Uh, and in that case, um, it will be a question of who steps in to provide order and to provide uh, economic uh, uh, 
uh, recovery. Uh, and it could be the US, but it's difficult to imagine the US being committed to that, or it could be China. Uh, you know, I don't want to give specific examples, but there are certainly countries that are struggling uh, and they will continue to struggle in the coming years. Uh, this will open geopolitical opportunities. Um, then we're seeing, of course, the question of technology where I think the American approach uh, is, is, is dangerous because it seems to be suggesting that no Chinese company can be present in the global economy, that by definition, a Chinese company is a threat to our security um, if it is successful. So we haven't come up with the right framework to approach uh, China's economic rights. Um, we still don't know what to do about it. Uh, we feel that, um, that it is a threat, even a national security threat. But at the same time, if what we have to offer China is either go back to making shoes uh, or you're going to be excluded from global markets, uh, this will not work. Yeah. We have two or three minutes to go, so maybe we can, we can hear uh, your, your comments on, on the economic question before we turn. You know, it's questions. a big issue in India. We still haven't come right. to terms with how to deal with China's economic rise. And basically, she was our biggest trading partner in goods. Now, after the border uh, problems, there's a... Uh, repeated calls to boycott Chinese goods, to try, at least to reduce dependencies, uh, which I think some of which you mentioned, you know, about the apps. And uh, I, I would be amazed if the Chinese who were bidding for the 5G uh, rollout in India, whether they were actually allowed in. Uh, so I think it will have economic consequences, but how far this will go, I think it's difficult to say. Right now, we're still going through the discussion. You know, the Indian reaction, like China's reaction, is to say self-reliance, that we need to do much more ourselves. Xi Jinping said so. Prime Minister Modi said so. Uh, and I think the question is, does that shade into autarky, into import This means having a wider range of sources of supply of various goods, and still being engaged in the world. I would hope it's the latter, because uh, then it seems to me the recovery can be quicker, and we can improve our own competitiveness in the world economy. Uh, but uh, that's still an open question. You know, it's interesting, the Indian economy, the rural economy actually has done quite well over the last few months. It did not crash like the rest of it. It's the formal urban manufacturing sector which suffered the most. But the informal sectors, many of those are still going on. And, and the rural economy has actually done quite well in the, in the second quarter, uh, despite all this uncertainty. So for us, it's, it's still hard to say. I mean, you get a range of predictions for the Indian economy that there'll be negative growth this fiscal year. Some still say, I mean, the IMF originally said 1.2% growth during this year. Now I think they've lowered that as well. So for me, the economy is, is the one of the moving balls that we really need to watch very carefully because that's going to shape the politics and the extent to which countries withdraw into themselves, stop participating in global <laughs> politics. And certainly... Uh, I think we've missed chance because a time of crisis, a time of destruction like this is a time when you have a chance to rework things. But the multilateral system failed us, or at least the traditional multilateral system obviously did nothing, not the G20, not the UN, nobody. I mean, it, they, and other countries didn't come together to do to step forward and help each other either. So for me, that's unfortunately, we've missed one opportunity. I think we have another one in another, you know, three months, six months when the recovery, signs of recovery start appearing in the world. And I do hope we take that. What do you think? But as, as you said at the beginning, um, perhaps we shouldn't uh, uh, overplay this idea of decoupling because if we look at the news, there's always a case that is very public and very publicized where decoupling is happening. But then in the background, uh, these networks are still working. Trade is still going on. American companies are still investing in China. Uh, and Chinese companies are still investing in the US. 
This often takes place in sectors that are not considered strategic, um, but they are significant and the volume is significant. So perhaps we still have to work uh, the, the sort of the paradigm that we're entering, but in a way we're going back to ideas in the 60s of industrial policy. Right. You select sectors that are strategic, but I think industrial policy is a better term to describe what is happening than decoupling. Uh, we have to wait a bit more, but I don't see decoupling in that comprehensive manner where economies would decouple as a whole. I don't see that happening. Uh, I, I think Europe has the best happening. experience, actually, of industrial policy, of how to handle these issues. So I think there's a lot we could probably learn from Europe in this. Bruno, Mr. Menon. So should, should we turn to questions? Yes, and that was fabulous. And let me let me get straight uh, go straight off and ask you both with what's been happening with the USA and China is there a potential of actually the European Union and India joining hands to be able to fill the void uh, that America has perhaps uh, provided uh, an, an opportunity why isn't the European Union and India coming together in a far more robust way uh, than we're seeing right now what's lacking Bruno? Can I, can I start? Yes. Uh, well, I think what is lacking is there's a certain lack of imagination in terms of the political structures and institutions. We're a bit stuck with ways of doing things that are not really very effective or very, very powerful. You know, state visits, um, they, they look good for a couple of days on newspapers, but that's not how you bring two economic or political blocks together. And then you have this sort of uh, myth and the magic figure of the free trade agreement, uh, which is so large, so imposing, so difficult that it goes on for decades and it's never signed. Uh, I think we need to develop structures and institutions. Uh, for example, an international consortium on 5G, where Europe and India would work together. It has to be something in between the sort of uh, 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 ret ret rhetoric of, uh, of uh, media interviews or state visits and this massive free trade agreement, something smaller but effective with immediate impact. So there's a certain lack of imagination that comes from this sort of uh, neoliberal environment where there's only the free trade agreement. That's the only way we can uh, create political novelty. We need other ways. We need to come up with other ways. Mr. Menon, do you think your, your colleagues, your former colleagues in South Bloc and the PMO are even cognizant of the fact that this is a possibility? Oh, I think they hands are. With Europe? I think they are, and I think many of them, in the EM, for instance, has been speaking about it in the last two months quite, quite openly. Uh, but I agree with Bruno that, frankly, A, we don't have the bandwidth to do this. We, we lack capacity on both sides and experience of, of a kind of intimate relationship which we had. Now, I don't think we can replace what the US has been in terms of a provider of global public goods. And I don't think we should try. But what we can do is much more in certain fields which matter a lot, like technology, like cyber, like internet governance. These are areas whether it's, you know, and not, I don't mean just privacy and data protection, where Europe has excellent experience, but in the whole area of competition policy, of industrial policy. And these are things that we need to do anyway for ourselves, we should be doing, but we should be doing this together and in the process, getting our firms and our people to actually work together. And I think we can. There are two questions that I'm going to put together to both of you. One is from Asma Mahmood, who asks, how much of this China view has to do with Pakistan and the relationship of Pak Sino relationship? And Harshit asks, is, the, is India's focus of the natural enemy about to change? There's always been an automatic belief of viewing Pakistan as the primary enemy. Let me ask this of Mr. Menon and perhaps Bruno, you can take uh, the Sino of uh, the Pak Sino relationship question. Well, I think, you know, I have argued now for 20 years that our primary challenge is China. And increasingly, Pakistan has been a subset of that, of the challenge from China. If you look at the increased Chinese commitment to Pakistan over the last few years, especially since 2015, since the announcement of the China-Pakistan economic corridor, Gwadar, Chinese presence in the, China, in the Pakistani economy. But even before that, 
It was China that made sure that Pakistan stayed one step behind India in missile development, in nuclear develop, nuclear weapons development, and so on. And so that tie is an old tie, that Chinese commitment to strengthening Pakistan and to making sure, to making sure that Pakistan can secure herself, irrespective of how Pakistan behaves. That's, that's an old commitment. To that, now you've added a whole set of new interests in the last five years or so. And so, yes, I, I actually have argued for a very long time, for 20 years, as I said, that our primary challenge is China, is dealing with China, not Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan is, is, I think, a strategic distraction for India, actually, uh, because and I'll, let me, I don't know how to put this politely. Even if we settled everything with Pakistan tomorrow, how far would our lives change? But what happens in your relationship with China will change your lives and will determine your future. And that has been true for many years. Bruno, do you want to take the Pak sino relationship? I, I, I normally hesitate to make many comments on, on, on India-Pakistan uh, relationship, but let me say the following. Uh, I was in Pakistan for three weeks in January, just before this whole thing started. And what impressed me, of course, is how deep uh, Chinese presence is to the point where political and economic decisions in Pakistan are now openly being made in light of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Should we do X or Y? What fits better with China Pakistan economic corridor? This is a conversation. Including, the new, map, including the new map that they've just released. <laughs> that, that's correct. So, you know, my impression, uh, and my Indian friends will tell me if I'm, if I'm wrong or onto something, is that pretty quickly Pakistan will become a China problem for India and not a Pakistan problem. Um, that uh, you'll have to deal with Pakistan as essentially. Uh, uh, in, in some respects, the Chinese economic dependency, uh, and, and that will be the problem. And Pakistan's government uh, is already, uh, for the most part, uh, following the instructions that it receives from Beijing. Uh, what I also found out in Pakistan is that, of course, the security and military apparatus feels very differently about this. Uh, it's still quite suspicious of China. But increasingly, Pakistan um, decides uh, according to what is in, in, in the Chinese national interest. Uh, and this is obviously a, a, very, a very big problem for India. Let me, uh, let me put, uh, they've already given us a wrap up, but let me quickly ask you these two questions. Ria asks, connection with rise of right-wing parties and increasing strife and tensions among, amongst countries. I mean, is there a connection with the rise of right-wing parties in increasing strife and tensions between countries. Why is there such a strong need to prove loyalties to the motherland or fatherland? And why is that a qualification of nationalism? And Asma Mahmood asks, for globalization to be a successful idea, don't we need at least some ideological level playing field, democracy versus authoritarian nation? May I? Either of you. Uh, very short answer. As government's capacity to deliver economic growth, uh, security, internal security and stability and social progress has diminished, their reliance on nationalism, patriotism, so-called, for legitimacy has grown. And you've seen authoritarians come to power across the world. I mean, Trump is only the last, actually, of that series. And therefore, that reliance on nationalism, which makes it very difficult to do the normal business of life, which is to live with other people, make compromises, adjust, and do what diplomacy does best, which is keep the peace. And that's why today all these hotspots are hot, rather than just cold, frozen conflicts across through Asia. Uh, that, so globalization doesn't actually require a common ideology. Uh, if it did, it would never have worked through the 80s, 90s, and the noughts. Uh, I think it's, it's a myth that uh, democracies don't fight wars with democracies, that you know, all these, these are comforting myths. But they, I don't think 
you need actually ideological conformity. Because if you lay that down as a necessary condition, then you're into regime change. And you're in the business then of actually changing other people's minds and of thought control, basically. And I'd be very nervous of going down that path. Which we have, as we've seen in America, failed. I mean, the CIA pretty much failed in that through the 60s and the 70s in every possible right. way. Bruno, did you want to add to Mr. Menon? Otherwise, I'm going to take a quick... I, I think the, the fundamental phenomenon here is a rebalancing of world politics, uh, that the extraordinary dominance of the West over the past two centuries is coming very quickly to an end. And in fact, the rise of nationalist parties comes from that. Uh, they are rising in the West because the West feels it's losing power and wants to preserve it. And it's rising in other parts of the world because some of these countries feel much more confident that they can make their own decisions in independent, independently from the West. That's very obvious in Turkey, for example, where I, where I live. Um, so that's the fundamental phenomenon. I mean, it's not going away. I think what we need for the new age is balance of power. Um, all these poles of power, poles of economic development, and even different ways of life should be able to live together. And what we have to be focused on is making sure that none of them is too overbearing um, or is uh, um, creating instability. Um, so the problem of China, in my view, is not that China has different values. The problem of China is the way it is creating instability in so many parts of the world right now and over the past six months. And other countries have, in some respect, to come together to provide a balance to, um, to, to geopolitics, to global, to global politics. Mr. Menon, Madhu, Men, Madhu Mohan asks, why is an international river like the Brahmaputra flood management, uh, why hasn't this been done, sorted out between India and China all of these years? Actually, flood management on the Brahmaputra is primarily an Indian issue. Because if you look at, uh, during the dry season, of course, you know, less than 6% of the flow, river flow actually comes across from Tibet. Even at the height of the monsoon, it's, uh, you know, it, it actually does not rise very much, the changes. So you're not, most of the water that we're dealing with here is actually on our side of the watershed. And, is, and so flood control, frankly, is not an international problem on the Brahmaputra. It's an Indian problem. It's an Indian problem. The problem is that the flow from Tibet is essential for the life of the river to keep it going during the dry season. That's a different problem, which we need to negotiate with China and deal with. But, but it's not, but flood control is primarily what we need to do at home. And the last question that's going to put you on the spot, Mr. Menon, is that given that India has a strong, seem to have a strong government at the center, why have there been a multiplicity of voices which has confused the communication between India and China? I think you have to ask the government that. Uh, you know, it's, but in, in one sense, it's understandable. You know, we, we are an open plural society. And I used to tell my Chinese friends, you know, don't get confused. We do in public what you do in private. We argue in public, we express our views. Don't think that that means that we can't make up our mind or that we don't ultimately end up. Just because you do it behind locked doors doesn't mean that you don't differ among yourselves. So at one level, I think where in this crisis, we could have done a much better job of strategic communication with our own people. There, I think, yes. But I don't think the Chinese were that confused. I think the Chinese, I think, probably understood what we were saying and what we were doing. But yeah, it is, it is a complicated question. Bruno Macias, Shiv Shankar Menon, thank you so much for that wonderful conversation. We could have carried on speaking forever. Thank you all for watching. I'm so sorry we couldn't take all of the questions that you all uh, streamed in. Sorry, Mr. Parikh, that we couldn't take your question. We thank our official radio partners, Red FM Bajati Raho, and we hope you enjoyed the conversation. And we'll be back at 8.30 p.m. for our next session, The Heart of the Matter, Understanding the Economics of the Pandemic, the COVID-19 uh, it, this is a selection of perspectives on COVID-19, the post-pandemic future, and its repercussions on the global economy from discussions featured on JLF's Brave New World. This particular episode will feature 
a host of brilliant speakers, including Nobel laureates Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, Milbank family, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, um, Neil Ferguson, Coolidge Professor of History at Harvard University, Maya Jasanov, Global St Strategy Advisor, World Traveler, and best selling author Parak Khanna, Diplomatic and National Editor of the Hindu Swahasri Haider, Editor in Chief of The Economist, Zaini Minton Bidos, and Senior Fellow at the Observer Research Foundation, Mihir S. Sharma. The session is at 8 30. It's a must watch. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you.